Well, Thanksgiving is done and the Christmas season is here. Merry Christmas. It's hard to believe it is here. And every time we get to that Christmas phase, I start to think back over the years of the different gifts that I received as a kid. We got this great opportunity to give and receive. It's a great season for generosity. I'm Brian Phipps. I'm almost 50. Here are some of my favorite gifts. Perhaps I should say I'm in my upper 40s. I uh, don't know if that's any better or not. No, so here's one of my favorite gifts. And if you're my age, this might be a little nostalgic, especially if you're a guy. Uh, if you are a much younger, you're going to wonder how in the world we were ever amused with these toys. But does anybody remember the Whirly Bird? Oh, yeah. This was awesome. It had batteries and everything. And you could actually take that little helicopter and see the little green hook? You could actually pick up stuff and drop off stuff, and then pick up stuff again. I mean, it was amazing. It's one of those great things. This one was the TCR, Total Control Racing Racetrack. Anybody have one of these or see one of these? Man, I love this stuff. You didn't see this? Man, I've got one memory of this. I'll just have to share with a more private uh, uh, thing. This is what, this one changed our household uh, significantly. <clears throat> snare drums, started playing uh, drums as an early kid. They didn't wait till the next Christmas. I don't even think they waited till the next week to get this. This is what they put over the snare drum so that it's not so loud as you are going through. My favorite gift, however, that I've ever, ever, ever received is captured in Ephesians 1, verse 13. I invite you to grab your notes out. You can see it there. You can also see it up on the TV here. I just invite you to read this with me as a declaration that we are recipients of the greatest gift ever. Ephesians 1, let's read it together. When you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. Circle and underline it, whatever you want to do, but that giving you the Holy Spirit, greatest gift I have ever received is the presence of Jesus, and that's what the Holy Spirit is. That's who he is. We, at Christmas, use the term Emmanuel, God with us. He is with us. He's in our story. We are wrapping up a year-long investment into understanding this entire book, We've walked all the way through it, hitting the major themes. And as you saw kind of in the little video before, the story is coming to an end. We've already seen it. We've seen it all the way from the very beginning to the end. And God, from the very beginning, all the way through the present and into the future, is saying, I want to be in your story. I want you to be in my story. And it's only in him that our stories will make sense. Write this big idea for the series in the blank, if you will. Everyone lives within a defining story. Everyone. Followers of Jesus embrace the Christmas story as their defining story. Now, last week, Rob introduced this series, kicked it off, and he used another phrase for this uh, idea of defining story, and he called it a worldview. I have on a pair of glasses right now, and these glasses shape the way I perceive the room, and we all have a worldview or a defining story that basically tells us who we are, who God is, what the world is, and how it works, and there's all kinds of different stories that compete for our attention. And what the scripture is saying is there's one story, there's only one author of the story that makes sense to the story, but we have to choose which story we will be in. Followers of Jesus embrace the Christmas story as their defining story. We're looking at different characters in the Christmas narrative and seeing how they and their participation in the story are much like us. We have an opportunity like they did to choose to step into that story. And today, the characters we're going to look at in the story are the wise men, the magi from the east. I want to read this story, give a couple of comments, and then we'll unpack it together this morning. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, these guys from far east, for them, that was Iran, modern-day Iran. Back in biblical times, it was Persia. And you might wonder, how in the world did they know about this king? 
Well, if you remember way back in the story, God's people had actually been moved over to Babylon. You know, Babylon had taken over, and then Persia took over Babylon. Persia, modern-day Iran, would have been very familiar with Daniel, who was in captivity in Babylon, a prominent figure in their empire, and actually left a book behind called Daniel. And in chapter 9 of that book, there is a timeline written out about the coming of a Messiah for God's people. And these men had taken all this time to study that, to understand that, and then took a huge pilgrimage in order to go, about 800 miles between ancient Persia and, and where Israel is today. And it's not the sweetest terrain. There's a lot of desert. That's difficult terrain to cover. They took the initiative. They went. They got to Jerusalem, they talked to the king who's Herod there, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go, make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child was with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And then here's the one we're familiar with. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of frankincense and of myrrh. Now, these gifts that they brought had significant value and significant meaning. Significant value. And they're not cheap. I mean, gold's gold. Precious metal. Frankincense and myrrh, also rare Items, But these men had been gifted for the story, and they brought them. But they didn't just have an exceptional value. They also had a phenomenal meaning, a rich meaning about the Christ child and his kingship and the sacrifice that he would make. The Christmas story that we want to catch from the wise men, that they got and they engaged in, is simply this. Everything we have is a gift from God. Everything. And if you want to experience full life in this story, then it's about giving it back to him your whole life. Everything that we have is a gift from God. And if you want to experience full life in this story, there's a generosity that's just natural to who we are. There's a give back spirit to Jesus. It's not mine. Now, here's the, the, uh, the other story that's prominent in our culture that we find ourselves dipping our toes in or maybe jumping headlong in and then realizing the danger of it. And the counter story is this. Everything you have, you've what? You've earned it. It's yours. And if you want life to the full, you got to hold on to it and have more of it because the presence of that is what gives Life, And we find ourselves struggling in this tension between our being citizens of heaven where that story makes sense and, store, and citizens down here who live in a consumeristic world. Here's the big idea, if you'll write it in. Today's big idea, like the wise men, we have been gifted for the story. And we've been given a lot. And it's more than just our resources. We're going to see that with all three of these gifts. We'll look at each gift, their meaning, and take a step of faith forward with each one as he leads us. Number one, we are gifted to give back financially. If you'd write that one in the blank. We're talking about the gift of gold. Trade value, monetary value, so it keeps the market alive. We have been gifted to give back financially. The Bible actually speaks an awful lot about money. But it doesn't talk about money and that we've got to have more of it or that God needs it. It talks about money as it relates to our hearts because God knows money, perhaps as much as anything in the world, affects how we experience the story down here. And it's in phenomenal ways. Matthew 6, 24, I'm going to quote from the King James Version, and I'll let you know why in just a second. Jesus used these words. No man can serve two masters, for either will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold on to the one and despise the other. Do you notice that there's no neutrality here? One of these is going to be a master, and one of these is going to be mastered. And then he goes on to say, ye cannot serve God and mammon. And what's mammon, and why'd you use 
the King James Version here, Brian. We don't normally do that. Mammon is actually, it's interesting. Mammon is actually a god of riches, and it's a Chaldean term, which is where the wise men were from, the Babylon Persian era. Richness, and, but there's a sinister kind of tone to this. It's kind of the, the god of wealth. And what Jesus is saying is, I'm God, I'm the real God. I know that there's another presence out there that's strong enough to be given deity status in your life. And it's a God called mammon. And you're either going to love the one and hate the other or hold on to the one and dismiss the other. You can't serve them both at the same time. Now, let me talk about the fruit of these different gods for a moment. Jesus says when he is God, and he has his appropriate place in, our life, place in our life. We start to bear fruits such as love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. That's pretty good fruit. I need more of that. I imagine you do as well. Interestingly enough, when mammon is in charge, when the things that we have become our master instead of tools that we master in order to serve the people around us, Different type of fruit is born in us, and I'm not making this up. This is a study that I read here in the last couple of weeks about an emerging nation who, generation prior, was poor. The, the children were poor, but now that they've embraced more of technology and are entering into first world kind of relations, they're experiencing a lot more resources. So they did a study before and after in the new generation coming up, and their assumption was that the new generation with more assets would be more uh, at peace or more engaged with the world. But here's what they said this harsh master did to that generation. They saw a rise in anxiety. They saw a rise in envy. They saw a rise in worry. They saw a rise in depression. Does that sound familiar? We're a one of the countries that has the most to steward. And when mammon takes over the heart, the heart starts to die. When Jesus has authority over the heart, the heart comes alive. I've got a friend named Tony who knew this story very well. Better than me, actually, as a young seminary student. I was serving a small church while I was in seminary, and Tony was a, a young mother of three young girls whose husband left her to take care of the three girls on her own. That's a challenge. That's significant. So Tony had to figure out how to, you know, start a career and all that. She decided she's going to go get her two-year nursing degree and hopefully, you know, use that as a means to take care of herself and her family. So I just remember watching her chase this and the perseverance that it took and the faith that it took. And just for two years, she just plug, 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 plug. We get to the end. She graduates. Everybody's all excited for Tony. Tony finally gets a job and then her first paycheck is on the way. She comes into my office and she says, Brian, I want to do something. I know the students are getting ready to go with you off on a, uh, a retreat in December, and my first paycheck is coming right at the end of November. I want my entire paycheck, 100%, not 10, not 2, 100% of my first paycheck to go to the church and be used so that these, all these kids can go. And I remember looking at her going, Tony, you don't need to do that. All he's asking for is, is this certain percent. You've worked hard for this. And she looked at me like I was the biggest dummy, like I was. And she said, Brian, do you have no clue that God's the one that's given me the perseverance to stay this long in this fight? Don't you know that it's God who gave me the resources to get the education? Don't you know that it was God that kept my kids from going crazy during this two years so I could get, don't you know that God gave me that? Don't you know anything, Phipps? <laughs> she got it. She got it. God was giving her joy in the giving. She gave the gift. We went on the trip. She experienced life because mammon was not her master. Jesus was. So my question is this, is your gold a gift from God? Do you perceive it primarily as a gift from God for him, or is it something that you've earned and has become more of a master than a tool to be used? It's a really important question. 
for us to consider as ones who have been given so much. And if you're more on the side of Jesus is in charge and I don't have all that anxiety and worry, go God. Give him thanks this year and stay the course. If money's crept in and another story defines you when it comes to your money, Jesus is so ready to say, come home. Come home. You don't need that anxiety. You don't need that worry. I've got your future a lot more than your money does. I want you to be at peace and at rest, and I want to bear fruit in your life. And some of you are saying, you don't know my 16, bro. I know some people 16 in here. And Jesus is ready to walk with you powerfully. And he invites you to have a generous heart and trust him in that. We've already talked a couple times about the harvest offering and the card that's there in your seat back. There's a reason we write our blessings on here, even if it's just persevering through. And there's a reason we write what our gift is going to be on there. We know that everything that we have is a gift from God, and we get to give back financially. Let's turn to frankincense. We also have the opportunity to give back transformationally. Transformationally, if you'll write that in the blank, we've been gifted in the story to give back transformationally. What does this mean? Frankincense is an essential oil. Now, that's a phrase I thought I would never, ever use uh, in my life. I don't normally have the essential oil things going off in our, in our home. Carol might get into that in some, at some point or not. But it was it's an expensive essential oil, and it was used in the Old Testament during the sacrifices that were taking place. Back in the Old Testament, God wanted us to know that he wanted to atone our sin, to, to cover our sin, to forgive our sin. And he knew that one day his son would have to come and become the final sacrifice. But to foreshadow that, he had animal sacrifices prescribed for a time. And I've never sacrificed an animal. I'm grateful for that. But I hear it does not smell good. And so God takes that ugly sacrifice that's taking place, and he prescribed the addition of frankincense all the way through the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament to be added to that sacrifice to take what was not a pleasant aroma and make it into a pleasant aroma. And one of my favorite verses in Scripture is in Romans 8, 29, and it says, He knew you before you were even born and he predestined you to become like his son, Jesus. Has anybody arrived at Jesus' status yet? If so, I want to go to your church. <laughs> you teach me. Standard operating procedure for most folks is to work harder to become like Jesus. Jesus has a different plan. He offers us the opportunity to give ourselves to him, and he adds his spirit, the frankincense, to take our sacrifice and make it beautiful. Look in Romans 12, where Paul writes about this. I'm actually using the paraphrase uh, called the message because I love the way Eugene Peterson unpacks it. He says this, take your everyday, ordinary life and place it before God as an offering. You know, we often take a card or an envelope or something and we put our gift in there and we, and we bring it forward. He's saying, no, 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 put a bow on you and bring me you. Offer yourself as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. In other words, don't get wrapped up in the dominant story down here. Instead, fix your attention on God and you'll be changed from the inside out. There's a West Sider here by the name of Tim, and Tim discovered this part of the story in the last couple of years. Tim struggled with alcohol most of his life, and that was one of the things that he wanted to fix on his own. I mean, when you struggle with substances or anything like that, it's usually a shameful, uh, guiltful thing, and we don't want to really bring that out for other people to see. We don't want to make that public. Sacrifice, we want to try to deal with that on the inside with God and me, and we'll figure this all out. That, thought, that got Tim into the hospital, and his, his uh, organs were starting to fail, and the doctors even said, shy of a miracle, you're not going to walk out of this hospital on your own. Well, that propelled two of Tim's friends to show up to the hospital 
and to pray for him. And they shared how Jesus is like this frankincense that when we offer ourselves to him, he comes into the sacrifice with us and changes us into something alive and beautiful. And it was at that time that Tim said, I'm putting this alcohol thing on the altar. I'm not going to try to fix it anymore. I can't. I'm going to offer this as a sacrifice. Tim not only walked out of the hospital on his own, Tim is now walking with many other men in his backyard as he leads his own men's group around a fire once a week. And there's people drawn to him to hear the story of how God has changed him and God can change them as well. We've been gifted, not just with gold. We've been given with frankincense. The Spirit of God has been give, give, given to us, and he is a power that exceeds every other power. Look at how that's spelled out in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul says, I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's mighty power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Jesus from the dead, and that is the power that you have been gifted with to become far more than you can on your own. I was the shortest, fattest, slowest, youngest kid in my grade. And that's just a stinky way to grow up. And I, perhaps as much or more than anybody else in my grade school, would, would lean in to the superhero stories and see that superpower, and I would dream of one day being infused with some type of superpower so that Alex and Wyatt Abbott, my fast, older, taller friends, I would just leave them in the dust. And I remember when a TV commercial came out for BB's tennis shoes, promise to make you run faster. And I remember getting those shoes. Mom and Dad finally got me a pair of those shoes. And I remember I was down at the Ponca City Airport in Oklahoma. We lived down there at that time. And I remember putting them on in the car and then saying, okay, Mom, time me. <laughs> Just yearn for there to be more, for some type of significance. Jesus is saying, I've gifted you for this story. I've given you gold. I've given you frankincense. I will change you. The way I've experienced real change in my life wasn't through a pair of tennis shoes, but it's engaging the love note that Jesus left behind. The Bible that he's left for us isn't just a book uh, uh, filled with either truth or fairy tales, however you approach that book, but it's a love letter about how to live life in this story. And what I found personally is that when I commit uh, four days out of seven at least to read that book, pieces of it, and say, Jesus, what do you want me to do today because of what I've read in the book? Life changes. And we've got a really cool way for you to step into that story this Advent. In fact, it starts today. This is our little Advent calendar, one activity for each day. Here's today's. You can read a little scripture that's in there, a little activity that you can do with your family, your friends, your roommates, or whatnot. One per family. These are free out in the Connection Center, if you're online with us today, you can also have an online version of this. It is in your program. And I encourage you, see what Jesus will do in 30 days when you abide with him. When you take a portion of your day, lay it on the altar as a sacrifice, he adds his spirit, the frankincense, and takes your offering and makes it into something more than you could ever ask or imagine. We've been given gold, frankincense. Let's turn to myrrh. Myrrh is another essential oil. But this one has a very special use in the scripture. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were wealthy Pharisees who followed Jesus. They followed him all the way up a hill to where he was crucified on a cross. And they brought myrrh to anoint his body and prepare it for burial. Oh, this is a fun way to end this message, Brian. Thanks. What's interesting to me is that the wise men may not have known this, but they knew something that, Je that but they were bringing something to Jesus that Jesus already knew about. His commitment to coming down here wasn't to receive. It was to give himself completely away. There was a brokenness between God and man. There was a disconnect between God and man. 
And he says, I'm going to be the first one to act. I'm going to come down, and I'm going to demonstrate a love commitment that no one has ever seen before. I am going to lay down my life for my people. He loved us first. And by the way, I can't wait for next year. 2017, we are going to be turning the volume up in so many ways about the loving Jesus part of our mission. We're here to love Jesus, become like Jesus, and share Jesus. And it all starts with loving Jesus. And we're going to talk about how he is a loving Jesus and receive that love symbolized here by myrrh. And our only response to a God, a Jesus that's gone all in for us is to go and give back totally. Did you write that in the blank? Give back financially, give back transformationally, give back totally. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 16. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. I have no idea how that works, but I know it to be true. And the presence of the Holy Spirit is the only one that can give us a lens to see this world in that way. To where when we try to hold on to our life, we, we, we miss out. But when we let go of our life for him, he takes it and he does something amazing with it, something beautiful with it. Most of us like to segment our life into different pieces. We've got a, a marriage piece. We've got a family piece. We've got a career piece. We've got a recreation piece. And we have a spiritual piece over here. And a lot of us give ourselves a whole lot of credit for having the spiritual piece in because there's a lot of our friends that don't. But what Jesus is saying is, I didn't come to get a piece of your life. I came to get all of you. I want to bring all of you alive. I've gone all in so that you have a model before you to come all in with me and experience the fullness of life. The Apostle Paul was one who got this more than anyone else. And here is his language. He says, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. And Paul had it, guys. He had education. He had riches. He had esteem. He, he was just, he had the whole American dream back in Israel. And he said, whoa, all that I used to find so valuable, now I consider it. It says garbage here, but that's a very purified translation of what he actually wrote. I would embarrass a lot of us if I came out with what he actually said. But he's saying, every time I tried to hold on to life, I lost it. But every time Jesus gave me the gift of seeing that the story is about me giving away, not holding on. And he found life to the full. What is your story? What story defines you? Do you truly see the story the way the wise men did? That everything you have is a gift and that full life comes in giving back? Or is the competing story in play? I want to give all of us here in the North Room at Lenexa and the South Room at the same, up at the Speedway online. Everybody have an opportunity to demonstrate physically that you are giving yourself to Christ. The cards are there. You've been told how to use them. What we're going to do is give you an opportunity to continue to just write those blessings down, those things that you're thankful for. And then in a little while, after some time of worship together, we're going to invite you to be released one row at a time in all of our rooms, one row at a time. So folks will come down, we'll come and we'll present either our cards with our blessings on it and perhaps our gift or our gift or both. Or maybe this is just a sign to say, Jesus, I don't know what to give, but I'm giving you me today. But we invite everyone who is able to participate and we'll guide you in that. Let's pray as we prepare to give. Jesus, you have gone all in because of your radical love and commitment to us. And you've invited us to see your story clearly. 
so that we can respond. And we're saying to you right now that it's true. Everything we have is truly a gift from you. And we want to give ourselves back to you completely. We give now of our gold, our frankincense, and our myrrh. Be pleased with our sacrifice to you today. Amen.